There has been a notable fixation in modern TV and cinema with portraying strong characters. Not necessarily nuanced, compelling, relatable, or fleshed out characters, but strong characters. Now, obviously, a well-written character can be all of those, and there's no inherent problem with trying to make sure strength is a prominent virtue. The problem is that Hollywood has been flirting with warped, watered-down concepts of strength for some time now. Actually, at this point, they aren't flirting. For all intents and purposes, they have wholeheartedly embraced the fallacy, made out with it, and are trying to reproduce with it as fast as possible. When you think of a strong character by today's standards, what traits come to mind? I see independent, proud, self-reliant, stoic, self-righteous, nigh infallible, unyielding, powerful, and almost universally capable, with the last two seemingly trending the most at the moment. Of course, few characters are endowed with all these traits, and they are rarely manifested in their fullness, but a cocktail of these qualities is unmistakable in what the alleged characters of strength say and do. Alas, when I try to apply most of the descriptions on that list to heroes and protagonists from years past that I consider to be strong, few of them actually fit. Today, characters like Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption would not be considered a strong character. Neo from the first Matrix film wouldn't qualify until roughly the final four minutes of the film. We do get moments that hint at the power of the one, but he doesn't own it until after the resurrection. Even classic female characters, once heralded as strong, may not quite be strong enough for today's standards. Ellen Ripley from the Alien franchise and Sarah Connor from the Terminator films are nurturing, caring, and emotionally and physically vulnerable who have moments of doubt, intense fear, come face to face with their limitations, and often seek out and genuinely require help from others. Now, parenthetical tangent, I included the qualifier genuinely here because contemporary characters can sometimes be seen teaming up or needing assistance, but those setups are often counterfeits that actually serve to show how capable the heroes are on their own and allow said capability to be marveled at or commented on by their impressed companions. It's the difference between one character emerging from a fight with scrapes, cuts, blood spatter, and tussled hair, and another getting beaten to a pulp and losing a limb. The former ostensibly shows the character's vulnerability while in fact celebrating their ultimate indomitability as they stand tall, impervious to their injuries, and the latter shows a truly beaten and defeated character in dire need. But I digress. I would certainly argue that the aforementioned leading ladies are indeed strong characters, but it's not because gritty angst, explosions of anger, and the handling of formidable firepower give them the right optics. Counterintuitively, Tony Stark initially possesses champion qualities of strength, but loses many of them as the Iron Man narrative unfolds. Pride is replaced with humility, although a certain level of cockiness frequently surfaces. Independence is replaced with cooperation, and cool, aloof appreciation turns into vulnerable affection. I'm not saying all of the characteristics on this list are weak or that they don't serve a great purpose in forming a character's arc. What I am saying is that I don't think they actually make a character strong. To demonstrate, let's take a closer look at a character I've known since I was six and one who I would certainly view as strong, Luke Skywalker. On paper though, it's not a great resume. First, he gets beaten down by a Tusken Raider and does little more than writhe on the ground in an undignified fashion before being rendered unconscious. Where's a respectable fight to show he's capable, able to take care of himself, and has untapped power? He gets bailed out by a geriatric general making howling noises? Unacceptable! Next, he turns down the chance to team up with a Jedi Knight, rescue a princess, and join the rebellion, his dream in a nutshell, by the way, because of the responsibility he feels to his aunt and uncle, even after discovering they lied to him about who his father was. Not exactly capturing the YOLO, defy authority, seize your destiny, do what makes you happy mentality that is so fashionable today. Put others first, delay gratification, respect your parents, weak sauce. A short time afterward, following a declaration that he's ready for anything, he saddles up to a bar in Mos Eisley only to get tossed across the cantina like a rag doll by an inebriated, disfigured doctor. Didn't he just get a lightsaber that he should intuitively know how to use? Why the crap is he on his back for a second time without having a single moment of awesomeness? I'm beginning to think this farm boy who has done nothing but fly his T-16, visit the Tosse station, repair droids, and work on moisture evaporators doesn't have any discernible combat training or technique. Inconceivable! Then his inexperience and ignorance of interstellar travel, particularly with regards to hyperspace, are put on display in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon where he is ridiculed and schooled by Han Solo. Traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops, boy. Watch your mouth, kid, or you're gonna find yourself floating home. Shouldn't this be where Luke shows off some of his piloting skills, putting the older smuggler to shame with maneuvers and knowledge that demand his awe and admiration? Missed opportunity! Finally, he battles a mildly weaponized metallic softball to a standstill as he manages to reach out with the Force for the first time. 
All right, he, he knows the Force exists and has used his feelings to almost see the remote. Time to unleash the beast. Vader Force choke, old man mind control, high level laser sword shenanigans, dazzling pizza piloting, here we go. Wait, what? He never ignites his lightsaber again after that? He only uses the Force at the end of the movie in an understated display of target acquisition? He doesn't down his first Imperial until nearly 90 minutes into the film, chalks up less than 10 on-screen kills, and shoots down a whopping three TIE Fighters, two of which come from the Millennium Falcon's gun turret? What the crap is he doing on the Death Star run? Strafing the surface? Are you kidding me? In what galaxy, no matter how far away, is someone like that considered a hero? More to the point, in what possible way could he be seen as a strong character? Well, first, I'd say we need to redefine what words converge to form a strong character. For me, it's qualities like sacrifice, selflessness, humility, courage, perseverance, wisdom, and adaptation. Not a comprehensive list, but it seems like a solid compilation. And some of those qualities are found in contemporary protagonists as well. The two lists are not exclusive. However, it could be argued that this new list simply makes a good character in the vein of benevolence rather than a strong one, and admittedly, those qualities can be very hard to actually demonstrate without taking time out of the story to draw attention to them. For the solution, let's take a look at three models for displaying strength. First, Strength Demo Delta. Look at my muscles. See how big they are. I'll probably need to Photoshop them so you can actually tell that I am flexing, but I will not tell you this. My bicep is assuredly as big and as hard as a bocce ball. Definitely stronger than whatever accent this turned out to be. This is the hollowest portrayal of strength, almost completely cosmetic. On the physical end, it's the posing, the posturing, the haughty glares, etc. Little, if anything, is happening, action is minimal, and the audience is simply being guided, more like corralled, to a visual design to say, Behold, a badass stands before you! On the verbal end, it's a character, usually not the hero, literally saying, Behold, a badass stands before us! Slightly more subtle examples are things like, You are the most powerful woman I know. Isn't he just amazing? I've never seen anyone move that fast. Only you can save us. And the world. How can I not be moved by such a selfless and stunning act? It is an honor to fight with one as honorable as you. And so on. A smart script or director will only utilize Delta level visuals to emphasize a point already made. If a character puts on a dazzling display of athleticism, marksmanship, and ingenuity, and then pauses for a moment in a dramatic pose, it's essentially allowing all the, the flavor of the action to seep into the meat of the character. Oftentimes, everything happens so quickly that it takes a second or two for the magnitude of what has transpired to click, and when it does, you want the audience's attention on the character, and in that moment, that snapshot needs to epitomize all the awesomeness that preceded it. As for the verbals, well, they are at best redundant or lazy, and at worst, cringe. It's been said many times, many ways, but if you have to say someone is awesome, they probably aren't. This is particularly true in a medium that is best served by showing, not telling. I find that when I'm literally told a character has a certain virtue or quality, I instinctively question whether or not I agree with that. It's distracting, and it almost comes across as a blast of writer or director commentary. It can have its uses in exposition or narration, but as live dialogue in a scene, it almost never achieves its overtly stated goal. Easy to way to tell it's ineffective? Anyone can strike a cool pose with a nifty weapon. Exhibit A. Anyone can say anything about anyone else. It doesn't have to be true. I can say, well, this kid right here is super strong. But the statement itself has no value on its own. If it comes after a display of strength, it's needless. If it comes without a display of strength, it's empty. We need action, particularly interaction, to get any gauge of a character's strength. Which brings us to Strength Demo Beta. Here, we actually see a character, the mighty Quantum Kumquat, interacting with something that literally and figuratively gives the action weight. Big step up from the first example, but still largely incapable of communicating genuine strength. At a glance, it seems impressive and a clear indication that Kumquat is strong. Super duper strong, in fact. But a nearly effortless display like this will buckle and collapse under its own weight and perhaps drag the whole story down with it. Though Kumquat isn't exactly spindly, he doesn't have a physique that suggests he could pick up a 300-pound box with virtually no effort. The fact that he is apparently able to do so creates two scenarios and neither of them leave him looking strong in any meaningful way. The first scenario is that he is just a normal, run-of-the-mill fella in average shape with nothing else going on except great fashion sense. No powers, no magic, no illusionary abilities. Just a guy. 
Well, if that's the case, there is a big discrepancy. Either he's using wires or some other trick of the camera to make it appear as though he's lifting that 300 pound box, or that box is perpetuating a fraud and does not actually have the weight it purports. As I'm sure all of you know, we as the audience incorporate suspension of disbelief to some degree when watching a film or show. The more fantastic and otherworldly the premise, the more suspension required. We know that there is CGI, that many gorgeous, robust looking sets, and let's be honest, some actors, are sometimes literally held together by paper clips and gaff tape. We know that giant 20 foot tall stone pillars have in fact been carved out of styrofoam and need to be bolted down so as to not topple over in a breeze. We allow a false reality to become reality in order to immerse ourselves in the story. In this example, you would have accepted that the 300 pound box may be completely empty in order to accommodate the actor's abilities and facilitate the needs of the scene. But for Kumquat, the character, to lift that box so easily requires you to accept a second false reality that even in the humble setting of this story, something supernatural is taking place, despite being assured that this is just a horribly dressed guy in the real world, as you know it, lifting this heavy box. The only possible solution then is that the box has little or no weight in the actual story, which means quantum kumquat isn't really strong at all, or at best that the feat does not prove out that truth, making it altogether worthless as a testimony of strength. The second option is that he is in fact imbued with superhuman power, a radioactive slice of fruit, an astounding midi-chlorine count, a masters from Hogwarts, take your pick. He is more than what he seems, and his actual strength cannot be accurately determined by his physique, or wardrobe. The plus side is that you can now easily believe that he lifted 300 pounds. Reality aligns and the audience is able to enjoy the spectacle. Ah, but you see, that's the problem. It's only a spectacle. It's something that inspires awe. It's eye candy with no substance or nutrients. It says nothing about the character other than that he is capable of doing things that others can't because of some fantastical element or gimmick. Sure, I mean, it's better than a pose or a statement, but it still has almost no weight. Never mind that it's proportionate. For a quantum kumquat, a man imbued with all the powers of a gamma-infused kumquat, lifting 300 pounds would be like a normal person lifting a cup of coffee. Does lifting a cup of coffee make a normal character admirable? Does it say anything of substance about them? Not particularly. But while these awe-inspiring spectacles don't indicate any worthwhile character traits that could amount to a genuinely strong character, aside from the purely superficial physical aspect, of course, they do tax the story and overall production. Spectacles have to constantly be surpassed to maintain their effect. If a stuntman jumps his motorcycle over 10 cars, he has to jump at least 11 on his next attempt for anyone to care. Usually it can't be a technical increase like that though. To inspire awe, it has to be significantly more challenging. More cars, bigger ramp, beefier engines, new gimmick, etc. There has to be perpetual escalation or the emptiness of the spectacle becomes painfully obvious. If I've watched the heroes dispatch 10,000 minions over the course of the film, simply doubling that number for the finale is anticlimactic. If the hero punches the villain across the city and through a dozen buildings, punching the villain back across the city through even more buildings is nothing short of tedious, particularly when it doesn't change the status quo. In short, showing a character doing superhuman or even just spectacular things should be a garnish used sparingly for a spike in excitement or wonder. Having a series of such events is a vacuous exercise that fails to provide any substance to the character and can in fact make genuine moments of strength appear underwhelming if they're able to be seen at all. Now I know the situation may seem hopeless, but fear not. Strength Demo Alpha is here to save the day. Behold, Clark Kent. <laughs> Exactly spectacular, huh? Just a dude with shrimpy arms struggling mightily to lift a heavy box. Now we get to the crux of the matter. The key word here is struggling. As you may have guessed or knew already, the key to revealing any kind of strength, physical, emotional, or mental, is to show the struggle. It is, in essence, an application of the adage, the hero is only as good as the villain. 
In a broader sense, we can say the hero is only as good as the challenge. Or more poetically still, and even more poignantly, you cannot have courage without fear. If a character is mostly or wholly invulnerable, their willingness to battle even the most formidable foe is an act of kindness. But it's not brave or courageous. They're risking nothing, and they know it. They have no fear, and so courage, which is doing something in spite of fear, can't exist. But it's not flattering to show fear. It looks weak. The same holds true with perseverance, which is doing something despite difficulty or delay in success. Andy Dufresne shows perseverance in Shawshank because he isn't just hanging out in his cell for a few years learning the ropes of incarceration. That's just living, existing. The fact that he continues moving forward, helping others, and as we later discover, orchestrating a masterful escape into a new life despite being repeatedly beaten, sodomized, viciously demoralized, and betrayed over the course of almost 20 years is what demonstrates without words, poses, or spectacle an intense strength of character. That's why Luke can still be seen as a strong character despite what appears to be a parade of failures and shortcomings. That he is shown to be so vulnerable, so naive, so ill-equipped to face an ever-increasingly dangerous and unjust galaxy is what makes his willingness to continue on the adventure admirable. Being willing to fight against forces greater than himself, enemies who can and often do overwhelm him because they possess more power or knowledge, makes his journey a struggle, which in turn makes even small choices understated testimonies to the strength of his character. In A New Hope, Lucas didn't just start Luke in a lowly place. He started him at the bottom of the galaxy, mired in coarse, rough, irritating sand that gets everywhere, and then spent the first act somehow cutting him down even lower. In that way, it's similar to Rocky, in that you think the boxer's life looks pretty rough at the outset, but for the next 30 minutes or so, it just gets worse and worse, culminating with a frustrated outburst that lets us know Balboa is well aware of just how miserable he is. For both characters, it means they can rise to comparatively great heights over the course of their development, but yet somehow their ultimate triumph isn't an oversaturated, fantastical affair that breaks the world or galaxy. Rocky just goes the distance, but from where he started, that's a satisfying achievement. Luke didn't carry the rebels to victory using force feats and fantastic flying. He wasn't felling swaths of stormtroopers with his lightsaber or wiping out squadrons of TIE fighters. After the escape from the Death Star, he was just one of many pilots with the courage and fortitude to go on what was, for all intents and purposes, a suicidal mission. He saved his fellow Tatooine, Tatooinekin, Tatooian, his friend from Tatooine, Biggs, downing one TIE fighter in the process, and that was about it. Even his final heroic shot was only made possible because of Han's last minute return. It was quite clearly a team effort, with many making the ultimate sacrifice, and though the galactic impact was considerable, Luke's own journey and contributions were rather mild. Yet it was a meaningful experience because of how far he'd come and how hard it was for him to get there. Give Luke crazy cool force powers by the time he gets to the detention block, and not only are you skewing towards a reliance on spectacle, but you are also forcing the adversity to ramp up exponentially just to maintain any sense of tension. And let's not forget the toll it takes on Han and Obi-Wan if a rube flies better than a seasoned smuggler and can fight almost as well as a Jedi who has decades of experience. Luke would be needlessly exalted at the cost of other characters, enforcing a subtle yet unmistakable sense that the galaxy somehow revolves around him. He may be the protagonist, but other characters need to have arcs, agency, growth, and strengths of their own, otherwise they are just empty shells that are a chore to watch. But bringing it back to these high production level demonstrations, lifting a 300 pound box with ease says nothing about the strength of a character, just that they are willing to do something they are capable of. Well done. Adding a few grunts, some sweat, and a little muscle flex helps, but those cosmetic additions just enhance the visuals. On the other hand, watching a character prepare mentally and physically, struggle, strain, and will himself to complete the task, that speaks to a plethora of strong qualities and gives the labor itself significance. If you needed that box moved, you might be more amazed by Quantum Kumquat, but you would be far more appreciative and the act itself would mean more being done by the humble Clark Kent. There's also the tertiary benefits of generating suspense and empathy and creating opportunity to root for the underdog while the outcome is still very much in question. To apply and hopefully clarify this concept, we're going to take a look at a scene from, you guessed it, A New Hope. Keep in mind, this is an exercise. I'm using a slight alteration to demonstrate a point. Though the movie is not perfect or beyond critique, I'm not suggesting this as an improvement or inferring that, if, well, if I would have written it, I would have done it this way because I'm so darn talented and awesome. 
It is much easier to armchair a movie after having watched it well over 30 times and find places to tweak it than it is to create something from nothing and give it life. I know this. With that understanding out of the way, I'll set the scene. A young senator, a teenage girl, is captured while in the act of committing treason against a cruel and violent empire. She is taken aboard a massive space station where she is interrogated, tortured, and subjected to a mind probe. She is forced to witness the literal destruction of her entire world. Friends, family, everything familiar, gone in an unprecedented display of terrifying power. She will not mourn long, however, as she herself has been scheduled for execution. Now, bear in mind, no one knows what happened to her or where she is, and even if they did, she is on a moon-sized space station bristling with weaponry. Her one Hail Mary wasn't to give R2-D2 coordinates of where she was captured, an approximation of the Death Star's location, or even a plea for rescue. Her request was for Obi-Wan to escort the plans in R2 to her father, where she was hoping they could uncover some kind of weakness in the space station. So, provided the stubby droid managed to get off the ship in one piece, locate Kenobi, who may be dead or simply too old for this sort of thing, the message would have sent her only hope straight to Alderaan, just in time to get blowed up. All that to say, there is no rational reason for her to think anyone is coming to rescue her or that she has any ally anywhere on the Death Star. So I'm wondering what she could possibly be thinking right here. Too short for a stormtrooper? Even if we determine that the pose she struck in no way says, well, hello there, it is decidedly casual. This is someone disturbed from her slumber by a friend during their trip on the Spartan but ample Death Star cruise line. Nonchalant and, dare I say, amused. She decides to make a quip, as if playfully deriding a chum. Is she perhaps hopped up on some hallucinogenic drugs, a leftover effect from her latest interrogation? Honestly, this would be the most likely scenario were it not for her abrupt shift into full cohesion a few moments later. Did she think it was a mischievous engineer cosplaying as a stormtrooper? Did she think her derisive rhetorical question would make him break down into tears, allowing her to make a break for the exit? I don't know exactly. Regardless, the line only works at all because we the audience know it is in fact an awkward farm boy inside the armor. Without that meta knowledge, her attitude and the line make no sense. This visit from a stormtrooper most likely leads to more torture or her execution. Why doesn't she seem to care? At all. This scene provides a spectacle at the cost of character. Strength demo delta, her pose, her body language says, I don't care, I'm just chilling. She's sexy and sassy, even in captivity. Strength demo beta, she can make jokes and mock her captors even when bearing the weight of failure, destruction, and imminent death. How strong she must be. Nothing says she's still in control like a spot on Zinger. She's a damsel to be admired and adored, and as you can clearly see, she is not in any kind of distress. She is essentially lifting that 300-pound box with ease, only this time it is supposed to contain an emotional and psychological weight. It is awe-inspiring that someone could heft such a heavy burden with no apparent strain, but it creates the discrepancy I mentioned earlier. Either she has some supernatural fortitude that no relatable human would have, or there is no weight in the box. It's not the former, because we know she is in fact a human teenager, and no amount of maturity or time spent studying politics and diplomacy on a pacifist planet is going to condition her to the extent that the loss of her entire world, the loss of all conceivable hope, and the specter of certain death, possibly after punitive torture, would have no discernible effect on her. Even if she was a grizzled, battle-hardened commando with the emotional stability and experience of someone twice her age, I would expect to see more of an impact. Therefore, in this scene, her pain and her struggle are rendered null and void. That's unfortunate enough, but the lack of weight inherently deprives her of any sense of bravery or pluck, despite obvious attempts to manufacture them. There's no trace of fear or consternation. Her flippant attitude merely says, There is no conflict. What if, instead, as Luke's coming down the hallway, we cut to a shot of her pacing her cell, maybe wiping a tear away, maybe sobbing quietly, not beseeching the heavens or wailing uncontrollably, just enough to show that she is emotionally grappling with reality and is slowly losing the battle. We see her fighting the anxiety, the despair. Shoulders hunched, the weight is palpable. The door opens and she instinctively tenses. Hands into fists, jaw taut, unable to swallow. She raises her chin in a conscious effort to hide everything she has been warring with since Aldrown became an asteroid field. A stormtrooper enters and she stares at him silently. Flight or fight grips her, and she is close to attacking him in a desperate, last-ditch attempt to escape. But then he speaks. I... I'm Luke Skywalker. 
Quizzical, she's not used to hearing a trooper give his name, but there is no explanation her mind can come up with for this abnormality, so she remains silent. He takes off his helmet, revealing the features of a young boy about her age. I'm Luke Skywalker. I'm here to rescue you. Now she finds her voice, but just barely. You're who? I'm here to rescue you. I've got your R2 unit. I'm here with Ben Kenobi. Ben Kenobi, where is he? And boom! In that instant, everything shifts. Given a viable opening, a way out, a path forward, all her anxiety, fears, and sorrows are overwhelmed by fierce determination. She is in no less danger, carries no less fear or pain, but it is the strength of her character that allows her to disregard her circumstances and put herself and her concerns to the side before propelling her out of that cell with a rekindled hope of victory. The fear, the anguish, the burden, the suffering, they are all there. We saw them. We saw the darkness, and therefore we can see the light of her courage, resourcefulness, determination, endurance, radiating against them. It's a sharp contrast, revealing her as a true fighter before she ever picks up a blaster. I'm not saying this would necessarily match the overall tone or that it would be an improvement on the film as a whole. I know A New Hope was essentially a fairy tale set in space, so showing her grappling with dark realities might not have been ideal. But taking this as an isolated event purely for demonstrative purposes, it makes her far more admirable, formidable, and badass than the way the scene plays out now which is largely just a plot point that raises a few questions if you think about it for a few minutes. Or, I mean, you know, several decades. There are people that balk at the protest. They didn't earn it. When it comes to characters perceived to be overpowered or who just seem to be so darn good at everything and move through the story in a charmed glide. The inference is that critics are whining because it's not fair for someone to be so darned awesome. But it's not a matter of being fair. A more accurate way to phrase it would be, they didn't build it. As in, there was no character building. It doesn't make sense for something to exist unless we see it constructed or manifested. The meaning of the protest isn't, that shouldn't be there. It's, the substance isn't there, but we are being told that it is. As I said, a character can't be presented as brave unless we see them face and overcome fear. Just because they are in a dangerous situation doesn't mean they're afraid. It has to be shown. But again, that's not flattering. Wisdom is not displayed by having a character choose between a really good idea and a really bad idea. It's revealed in the nuances of a difficult decision, juxtaposed with a subtle foolishness woven through the other options that ideally the audience doesn't initially see. Selflessness only has meaning when selfishness is a more viable or attractive option and the character genuinely cares about what they are surrendering. The beauty of the alpha option, proving strength through struggle, is that you don't have to pile on qualities or attributes. You don't need a pose or a line to make sure the audience perceives the character the way you want them to. The virtues are forged in the fight, and though we may not consciously tally them, we do acknowledge and appreciate them. As for which traits are rightly considered to be reflections of true strength, that, of course, is a matter of opinion. However, I have a theory, one that is almost completely untested because, let's face it, I've been prattling on for a long time now and I just don't have enough gas in the tank to tackle this at length. But my theory is that only traits that are produced by or are proven through adversity are legitimate endorsements of strength. A random example would be pride. Pride is not a strength. If you put someone through a struggle, if they fail, if they get beaten and have to rise again, if they make mistakes with true consequences, if they emerge from those trials with any self-awareness at all, they know humility, not pride. Satisfaction? Sure. Excitement for new possibilities? Check. Newfound confidence, most assuredly, but not pride. Pride can't exist when someone is actually aware of their limitations and shortcomings, even if they overcame them in the short term. They know they have improved, which is encouraging, but they are also aware that improvement is an ongoing process. Just as they would be humbled by looking back at who they were before being refined in the most recent crucible, they can know with absolute certainty that they will one day look back at who they are in this present moment with the same embarrassment. And if they don't, it means they haven't grown at all from that point. They haven't been challenged, which is sad. Now, bear in mind, this is not the same thing as looking at your past with guilt or shame. It's a completely different perspective. Now, since pride cannot logically be a byproduct of struggle, it doesn't resonate with me as a strength. If we remove the alpha test and just look at pride itself, we can come to the same conclusion. Pride is a liability. Look no further than Marty McFly in Back to the Future. For almost the entire trilogy, Marty was faced with various temptations or challenges that he would initially, wisely, back away from. But then an antagonist would call him Yella or a chicken! Very basic, almost childish attacks on his pride. 
and instantly a switch would flip. He would abandon all reason and readily take the bait. Disaster of some kind would almost always follow. He'd get into an altercation, break the law, lose his job, and then he even got into an accident that derailed his destiny. All for pride. A character who can easily be manipulated or provoked into taking foolish, self-destructive action because someone insults their manhood, family, religion, race, sex, aspirations, deficiencies, whatever, is weak in every sense of the word. They're a puppet, reacting predictably to every pull on their strings. Someone who struts across the screen with palpable arrogance because they are the biggest or strongest person in the room is a fool and a clown. And we used to see that predominantly in villains, but it's becoming a hallmark of modern heroes as well. I'll grant you, it can sometimes be a fine line between confidence and arrogance, and talking about pride often requires parsing semantics. But again, from my perspective, looking at the unfavorable cost-to-benefit ratio of indulging pride and my brand new spiffy alpha strength test, patent pending, I would eliminate it as an indicator of any true strength. Now, whether the alpha test can ultimately be validated or whether strength will always be in the eye of the beholder, at least you hopefully have a new understanding of the various ways strength can be portrayed on screen. And that's the whole point. I didn't spend time creating this because I wanted to say Hollywood is garbage or that modern heroes all suck. If that's all I wanted to do, I clearly could have done it with six words in about two seconds. The action item here is to challenge myself and, and anyone watching, particularly anyone looking to create stories that are driven by solid, relatable, and yes, strong protagonists, to take another look at what it means to actually build a character. And hey, if you wanna create a weak character, because realistic stories need those too, now you know what to leave out. I want to encourage you to take a look at characters that you like and admire. Ask yourself why. Is it purely spectacle? If you took away their powers or magic or weaponry, would they still be admirable or even worth noting? If you've never seen them truly fail or genuinely struggle, how would you feel if they did? Would that shatter your image of the character or would it make them even better? Being able to enjoy any character or film is a wonderful thing. But discovering why is going to help us understand ourselves a heck of a lot better and can make even the most trivial, poorly conceived project ultimately worthwhile. If you made it this far, whether you skipped around a little or not, I sincerely appreciate your time and willingness to entertain these concepts, even if it's just for the duration of this video. I've got some other topics rattling around that I'll probably need to explore at some point for the sake of my own sanity, so feedback on this video's execution is appreciated, as are discussions, alternative theories, counterpoints, and questions. Thanks again for watching. All the best. <laughs>